Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is our Zoning Bylaw Review Working Group meeting of May 29th. It is 11 a.m. We have one item on our agenda today, and um, apologize in advance, but we are restarting the conversation surrounding Article 10, our non-conforming structures, uses, and lots. The last time that we discussed this bylaw was over a year ago, April 25th of 23. We then um, discussed it briefly at our May 24th, 2023 meeting as well. Likely, like my memory, our memory collectively may be a bit foggy on what we talked about at that time. Um, so I propose that we restart this conversation. Uh, perhaps uh, while we get through it, it'll all come back to us. But the purpose of this is to sort of jumpstart the conversation so we can potentially bring this article forward to fall town meeting. So I've asked um, Mitchell and Richie to attend and sort of guide us through perhaps what we talked about back in April. Um, obviously, Bob Richie was the main author of, of the red lines uh, that you folks have received. And so I will pass the baton to both of those uh, individuals. And um, if you wouldn't mind, just sort of bring it, bring us back up to speed as to where we were, um, and then we can move forward. Thank you in advance. Well, I'd like to defer to Bob because he's the captain of our two membership here. Um, I did review the materials that bring us together and hope to be able to answer any questions. Uh, but Bob, would you lead us off? Well, um, good, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, morning. Nice to be back <laughs> together uh, to talk about zoning. And um, so as Jed mentioned, the committee did meet last, well, a year ago more than a year ago now. Um, and you should have the notes of that meeting, which indicate that that discussion got through section 10.4B. So um, I guess is if, now we have some new members. I, I don't know, we have some members who might not have been on the committee last time. Um, so do we wanna start from the beginning? and see if have, people have comments starting off with 10.1a and work our way down through, uh, you know, section by section through the, uh, um, uh, yeah, Bob, I think that would be helpful, especially yeah. considering even the members who were here before it was over a year ago. So even so my memory of it is, it might be helpful if I could just flip it back to Bob, the other Bob, uh, <laughs> Bob, if you could just set the context of this draft, you know, what, what the purpose of this draft was um, so that people can understand the background and how we got to this point. I think that might be helpful. Well, we started off with the foundational premise that the old bylaw didn't really adequately cover the waterfront. And so we thought maybe coming up with a bylaw that used whatever we could by cherry picking from the existing bylaw, but grafting those uh, onto a a core document that really did deal with non-conforming structures, uses, and lots in a manner that was was faithful to the statutory framework within which local governments uh, do zoning. And so we came up with a plan where we broke the concept of non-conforming into some preliminary sections dealing with uh, the uh, applicability of it by explicitly recognizing the statutory guardrails within which local governments zone. And so section 10.1, the, the main feature of it, is to articulate uh, in in text uh, the the collected preemptive provisions of Chapter 48, uh, Section Six, 
that declares uh, what uh, what bylaws uh, you know can't do. And so these are the uh, the provisions laid out in section ten point one b. And having said that in section one point ten point one b, we then need to actually put the language in the bylaw that applies those principles. So we created uh, 10.1c, uh, which deals with that topic in, in its general parameters before moving on to, uh, in 10.2, to the non-conforming non structures, and then uh, 10.3, existing non-conforming structures and uses and provisions that apply to those. <clears throat> And then in 10.4, non-conforming lots. Um, and there you will find a great deal of stuff that we extracted direct, directly from the old bylaw. Uh, to cover the waterfront, we put in 10.5, which addresses the issues of restoration, abandonment, and non-use. 10.6 uh, gets us into the weeds where we give anybody that reads the bylaw a better understanding of what we mean by the findings and exemptions. Um, and uh, that's basically it. But the sub subtext of the bylaw uh, tries to set the stage for the town to do uh, zoning in any way that it may wish to do so, uh, asking the question, is what we are proposing to do uh, somehow barred by some of the uh, uh, preemptive provisions of 40A6. And if the answer is no, then the town should feel free to do it. So a great deal of what's in the bylaw is at least a basic set of provisions that purport to express what the town wishes to accomplish with its uh, zoning provisions dealing with non-conforming uses and structures. Uh, but it's a it's a tabula rasa on which the court, the the, the uh, town can uh, add zoning bylaw provisions dealing with non-conforming uses and structures to the full range of what is permitted outside of the restrictions laid out in the preemptive provisions of 40A6. So in, in, uh, in altogether too many words, I've tried to just say how we approached uh, creating a bylaw that we think really covers all of the points and hopefully tease up the town uh, to approach zoning with all of the creativity which the statute does invite, uh, but just becoming consistently conscious of where the statute says you need not go past this point. And I guess that's, that's sort of the overall philosophy of what we did here. Thanks, Bob. Does anybody have any questions on 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 Bob's introduction and how we got here? No. Bob, Bob, you're sitting a little bit far away from your mic, and it's hard for me to hear. I don't know whether you can make it a little. Hold on a second. Is that any better? A, a tad. A tad. All right. Hold on a second. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I moved the volume levels all up, so I don't know what the problem is. It's just I'm in the same spot I'm always in. No, that, that's a little better one. Okay. Um, so, um, if there aren't, if there are, are, are there any questions about sort of Bob's intro and how we got here and what we're doing here? That's what I remember that we're doing. 
but the, because this is mostly a uh, a zoning board, um, the ZBA's bailiwick here, I'd be interested in hearing what what Frank, now that you wear both hats, um, what what you make of um, what we're working with, the materials here and Mara. Well, uh, let me just start. I uh, agree with Bob's comments about how we got here. Um, we've been talking about this for many, many years. So I think Bob has given us a pretty good um, overview of, of, of our charge as a working group to work on the zoning bylaw. I do have some comments, but I don't think I should bring them up now. I will bring them up as we go through the bylaw section by section. Mara, did you have any general reaction? No, I'm just looking forward to the discussion as it progresses through the proposed bylaw. Well then, let's start. Oh, I just want to apologize for my being late. I had a phone conversation with special town council and town manager's office. So I had a good excuse. Um, but I did go through the, um, you know, the article 10 that we're looking at. And I think, I guess we'll go through it, but um, I'm almost wondering if it might be worth perhaps a mini group looking at, you know, some of the language changes as opposed to trying to go through all those details with everyone. I mean, I'm happy to either way, but I realize it's very dense material that we're looking at. And I think we all realize that for the zoning board, this is uh, critical to the work that we do. Yeah, I think to Charlotte's point, um, and perhaps Noreen, what you're suggesting, you know, if, if you want to get together with some folks who are general practitioners on this section, by all means, uh, no issue there, but again, the the idea is to bring this forward for fall, fall, fall town meeting. So if we could do that as best we can for that timeline, that'd be great. I think we should go through this section by section. And if in the course of our discussion, it looks like it may need more detailed discussion by a smaller group, we can do that. But I think everybody should know what we're doing or what we're thinking. Well, one of the things I'm thinking is we thought this was ready to go before and then uh, pulled it out of the general a vote on recodification because it struck us that, yes, the, the attorney general was right. This is uh, perhaps a change. It's too much for a town meeting to deal with, um, but we were happy with it going then. Has it changed since then? Well, what you have in front of you hasn't changed. Um, it, you did have some editorial changes you recommended from the April 2023 meeting, which is in the, the sheet that you, uh, Jed sent around. So um, there are some tweak. There was tweaking going on, um, and a couple of questions came up, and so um, I, you know, likely this discussion will lead to perhaps some more tweaking. And that's the goal here is, I mean, I can't imagine you're gonna throw this out and start all over again, but that's up to you. Um, <laughs> uh, so if we go through today and you know another round, we can tweak it and get it polished up for a public hearing come you know, September or whatever. Yeah, I just thought- I remember, uh, about a year ago, time sort of compresses. Uh, I had a copy of the then draft uh, with a, a number of pencil annotations that uh, I believe Noreen uh, uh, gave to us to think about. And we went through those. And I have a copy. It's a much marked up version of what we're looking at today as the most recent draft. And I annotated it for those uh suggested edits uh, that Noreen advanced for us to think about uh, as being something we didn't find a problem with at all, uh, that we, we liked and we thought, yes, we can do that. Uh, 
in other places, we we said, no, we don't think that should be done because it cuts too close to the design structure of the bylaw. Um, and um, and I, I would imagine that in order to go forward, we should take the draft that we played around with a year or so ago uh, and actually create a, re a, a, rever a, a revised version of what we consider to be the most recent draft that incorporate those points on which we can, uh, you know, happily uh, do uh, what uh, Nor Noreen has suggested, uh, some of which really did help us uh, improve the language, um, and some of which we said, no, we don't think we should delete that or make the suggested change because it cuts too close to the thread of the of the uh, uh, integrity of the bylaw so that would be a draft that i think we would profitably have before us uh, as we go forward with this conversation but i don't see in the most recent draft uh evidence of us having done those things that we have agreed with noreen should be done yeah and just to to sort of um address that and and the reason for it is is simply because we dropped this about a year ago so right. i i think it's really valuable that we start from the beginning and and just go over what we talked about before even though it may be repetitive it's important okay because i as i was looking through this material was making changes based on the most recent version that you sent me um and changes that i think needs to be made to that and, you know, initially it, it wasn't too bad. And then it got kind of heavy in that, you know, when you're looking at, I don't know, sort of simple conflicts, like when you look at, or concepts, right? Where you say um, there, there are certain following preemptive provisions. And so in my mind, when you say preemptive, you're giving somebody a list of things that are not applicable. And then following that would be items that are applicable. But, you know, when I'm looking at the list of what's not applicable or preemptive and you say, but blah, 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 you're telling people two different things, right? You're telling somebody that something's preemptive unless. So to me, that creates a conflict in the list because you're pre presumptively telling people what's in this next list is all of what's preemptive. So I, I just feel like it creates some confusion and maybe it's extra language if you say, you know, what's preemptive and what's not, but it just seems confusing to say, here's my preemptive list with the exceptions woven in. So the... the purpose of 1B is to create a litmus test that any uh, any zoning proposal that is governed by the new bylaw uh, invited by the applicability sections of 10.1C, uh, that test always should be made whenever zoning is done and and zoning is done in accordance with the provisions of 1c which talk about the applicability of the bylaw the litmus test is always to go back to 1b and say well uh can we can we say confidently that what we are doing is on the safe side of the of the guardrails that we publish in 1b so i i don't i don't don't see the the conflict here i think that uh, conceptually, 1B sets the stage and and uh, and, uh, and and lays out the arena within which local zoning could be done under 1C, and and just offers a a litmus test on anything that the town wishes to do with zoning. So, well, I guess um, I I am I am completely content that the statements that we include in 1B are in their totality an accurate restatement in simple English uh, uh, than the obscurity of chapter 48, section 6 itself, 
which the courts have consistently said is the most impenetrably dense section of the general laws. So with the with the salvage, sal saving provisions of 1B, we hope to equip the town with an intelligible uh, way to judge the legal uh, adequacy of what they do with their zoning. So I guess where I'm sort of trying to figure out how to parse this out is I'm looking at um, 10.1 B C, right? And you're talking about yeah. uses, uses lawfully begun, right? Right. So the first sentence is fine, but then the second sentence says the bylaw shall apply to any change or substantial extension. So your your heading of that category is the preemptions, but then you have except exceptions within the preemptions. So I don't know whether we either want to change the list so that we have the preemptions and then what's applicable or whether we want to change the title of the category. It it just seems confusing to me that you're giving people the exceptions and the non-exceptions mixed in together. We're not trying to restate, paraphrase faithfully what the general laws say on the topic of loss of law, uses lawfully begun. Uh, in, sub, in section C, we try to cover that topic adequately. And by the first sentence, we, we simply say uh, what they don't apply to, making it clear that the, 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 the corresponding uh, area in which the bylaws do apply are stated. It's a logical additional thought that does not conflict with the first sentence and really does try to communicate in meaningful, simple English to anybody who wanted to know about law, the, the scope of the exemption for law uses lawfully begun by s s putting these two sentences together, uh, making it clear that what we have to say about it is this is what you can't do, but be aware that this is what you can do. Uh, so I, I don't see that it, I don't see that the second sentence is is a violent uh, departure from the point of subsection C and does help to the reader to understand the scope of it. Would it so, be helpful to put in, in section C, the second sentence, the bylaw shall apply to any other change or substantial extension of such use? No, because it wouldn't be clear what other referred to. Yeah. You think so? I, I think any any change of substance that is is right out of the statute. And I think we should stick with that. All right. So what if in 10.1b, what if you just removed the word preemptive from uh, the title and from one such that you're telling people what the provisions of uh, 40A is, 40A section six, right? And so you're saying, yeah. here's here's what 40A section six says that you can and can't do. Because I think if you remove the word preemptive, you're not expressing to people that you're focusing on exceptions rather than here's how that language is used or we're going to use it here. I agree with you. Legally and grammatically, you are correct. However, uh, in an attempt to let the bylaw actually let people know what we're talking about, I think it's useful to know that these statute provisions are preemptive in nature. And so if anybody reads them and, and isn't tuned in to the fact that they are preemptive in character, um, that could lead to confusion. But adding the word preemptive in front of it, since they are legally preempted, 
right. uh, it's useful to use the term. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't have a strong, uh, uh, you know, desire to oppose that change, um, well, but okay. but I I would prefer that it be kept. Okay, so here's my other option: is that what if after the preemption that you offer, you then use the word exception, right, with a colon, and then say so for two forty ten point one b. 1c. So the first part would be fine. Uses lawfully begun. And then the second sentence you'd preface by the word exception so that people would understand that the first sentence yeah. is the preemption and the second sentence is the exception, right? So that you're you're drawing their attention to going from what you're describing as a preemption to yeah. what what has to be an exception. That that does not do violence to uh, subsection C at all. You could say the bylaw, however, shall apply. Or, you know, you could use exception. That That's fine with me if you want to do it. Okay. Because I'm just looking to, you know, not for myself because I've been sadly doing zoning forever, but, but for the future where people have less time to dig into the weeds, right? Or whatever it is. And if we try to better provide them with really clear guidelines about, you know, this is a yes and this is a no, or, or here's the yes and here's how you would apply an exception, just so it's a little bit more clear to people. Yeah, so, well, keep in mind that the the rubber meets the road in 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 one C where we do talk about the applicability, um, right? But we'll run into circumstances yeah. where, like any good book, somebody will say, "Hey, look, the sentence in chapter one said yeah, the house yeah. is red," but then they yeah. read to the back of the book where it said, "Yeah, the house was originally red, but then the subsequent people painted it white," right? So people will okay. point at one section and say, well, here's clearly what it says without reading the totality. Well, does that, here's, here's the, yeah, I don't have a, a strong feeling on this, but if you made that change to subsection C, uh, if you went up to subsection B, special permits, would you also have to put some sort of exception there? Like say special permits and exception, COLA, it does apply uh, to issues, uh, to permits issued after the first notice. And now we're starting to add bulk and density to the bylaw. I mean, um, if if you start carving out exceptions to subsection C, do you need also to stick exceptions in front of each of the other uh, 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 sections uh, in 1B? Well, so you know, I was focusing on B, and I was only focusing on B because of the title where it says preemptive yeah. provisions. So to me, yeah. as a lay person, I would look at that as being my Bible list of what I can do, essentially, as of right, I'm not affected by the bylaw, because you're giving me all of what's yeah. protected. But, yeah. but within your protected list, you've also included exceptions. Yeah. So well, I would actually, I would actually prefer if it came down to a choice, yeah. to simply delete that second sentence uh, that keeps the parallel provisions, uh, keeping the the uh, subsections in parallel format. Yeah, and because and if, if in fact, if in fact. Uh, substantial extensions and changes are applicable, they're going to be applicable under subsection 1C. Right. So, so uh, yeah. If I, could, yeah. if I could just interject here, um, for consistency state, if we're either going to add the word exception in C or delete the second sentence in C, we have the same issue applies in D because the second sentence is also except as yes. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, so I whatever that, we need yep. to make a decision here, either delete those sent do you want to delete that whole sentence in section D with the subsection one two um 
uh, or if you want to keep this language in, just put the you know the word that Noreen recommended exception in both B and C. So, so if, yeah. if we could come to some consensus about that now, that would really be helpful. Could I, could I just say that the word however is used in F. So there are two constructions dealing with this pro problem of exceptions to the preemption. It seems useful to keep the exceptions in because they saw future probable arguments right there. So it makes it clearer, but it should use either, it should be consistent to use either however or accept so that you've got the same construction. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, like I said, I'm perfectly happy with labeling those, you know, um, others, if you will, you know, just by putting in the word exception and then a colon so that it, so people understand that there's literally a stop sign there. And that if the first sentence is not applicable, but the sen second sentence is, that you have a further requirement. Okay, so. so I'm I'm fine with either way. I I just would like it to be very explicit to people because, like I said, you know, lay people reading the bylaw, we would really like it that people would be able to read this and use it. And you know, when we as staff are sort of wrestling with what does this mean and what does this say, it makes it even more difficult for us to help guide people. So I, I would suggest that while, wow, however, an exception kind of on the same page, page if you will, um, and, and I thank Charlotte for pointing out that inconsistency. We change, however, to exception, because to me, the word exception, exception jumps off the page more than the word however. And oh, absolutely. To Noreen's point, you know, we're trying to make people read this and understand it right away, saying this is preempted except this is not preempted. So right. if we can agree to put the word exception in B, C, uh, C, D, uh, where are we on? Uh, C, D, and F. Right. And move on. Would that be okay? Would that be acceptable? <laughs> that I think that would work for me. Um, I did have a couple of minor word changes. I don't know if you want to get into that level or whether you just want me to send those. Yeah, no. I mean, I would suggest you just send those because I I I'd don't like want to torture to you through as much of the bulk of this today yes. and yeah. we're not get bogged down into this word or that word. And no. Right no, now. I get and you. And then we can, you know, go yeah. from there. So. Yeah. so how would C be read now with the with the exception? How would you read it? Uh, this... zoning, uh, zoning bylaws adopted or amended shall not apply to uses lawfully begun before the notice. Exception, colon, the bylaw shall apply to any change or substantial, uh, a, a substantial extension of such use. Just adding the word extension, colon. Exception code. Yeah. Yeah. And would you make the same change in B it's about not special B. permits? No, because there's no second sentence in B. Okay. Yeah. So, so that language, well, yeah. All right. I won't get and into it. So it would be made in C, the second sentence in C, the second sentence in B, which now starts except. We just make that exception. And then on F, and the last sentence in the main paragraph starts, however, we would change that to exception. So they're all consistent. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. All Excuse right. me, I'm going to be right back. Any other comments on 1B? So I do on number three, where you have variance there. And I'm thinking that there should be more uh, robust language within the variance there. I think, you know, again, looking at lay people, lay people by and large do not understand the concept of variance and also don't understand what would be required of them. 
Well, there's a whole section in the bylaw that has all that information. I don't right. think duplicating all of that here is, uh, you know, really. But that being said, I, I did um, put a note in my um, edits here to strike out uh, a section of that statement so that um, you would have it read a variance shall be required where the alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change. And then I was struck out increases the non-conforming nature of the structure or, and then leave it with creates a new non-conformity. So I think that's more in line with the court cases. So my memory of this section and our previous discussion uh, in April of last year was that we were deleting this section. This okay. whole variance section was going to be deleted. Okay, so I just printed out, Jed, what you sent as the last red line version. So that's what I was working with. No doubt. And so that's yeah. that's sort of what that's sort so, of why we wanted to start with this is where we were, yeah. this is what we covered. Let's okay. I, I think it's really important we go through that first. Okay. Cause so I was using the page that you sent, which still has the variance language, I guess, there. Yeah. It must yeah. So uh, that 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 doesn't show up in the notes from the meeting. That no, up. but it does show up in my copy of the document. Um, let's see, my copy of the doc, you can't read it, but it 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 has Noreen's suggestion and I annotated it. Okay, delete it. So, I mean, we, I did make notes from our last conversation that are consistent with what Noreen just said. Okay, so maybe I'm just not looking at the most recent change. No, I think you are. I think you are. It's just that we haven't incorporated those right. changes that we discussed and agreed with or disagreed with back in our meeting a year ago. All right. Because I don't mean to uh, duplicate myself, but I guess I wasn't clear that we were all on the same page. Okay. Right, so, so okay. Bob, do you think it would be valuable to go through the notes that you had um, provided to us or at least describe to us, you know, what those notes indicate in our minds uh, and go through these sections and based on what we were discussing back in April? Because it, it does come up in the notes section uh, on the second page. It just, it was unclear at the time what the working group wanted to do with it. But based on my viewing of the tape from the last meeting, it was decided that that section was going to be deleted and we were going to rely on the variance language later on in the Bible. Yeah. That makes sense. So if we, Bob, if we, um, as we go through each section, if you want to raise um, the notes that you have and explain what those notes say, for the whole group, sure, and then we can yeah. uh, we can do it that way. Yeah. All right. So now we're on one C. Can I go back for a second to one A? Oh sure. We we kind of jumped over that. Um, this is just a kind of a, a question or a comment, but um, in in one uh, ten point one A one, you say non-conforming structures, uses, and lots shall be understood to mean structures and uses that do not conform. What happened to lots? What section are you referring to? Right at the very beginning, 10.1A1, yeah. non-conforming structures, mm -hmm. uses, and lots. Yeah, yeah. good pickup, Frank. We just need to add the word lots in there and a couple Except of Except that I, um, we treat non-conforming structures and uses differently from lots, which is why that jumped out at me because we have a whole section on lots. I'm wondering if the word lots even belongs there, but. Because um, they are they are differently and they're treated much differently. 
Yeah, I think for the Bobs, there's a, a different vision in Falmouth than in other communities where in other communities, if you had a non-conforming lot, it would typically confer non-conformities on the, the dwelling, right? And here in Falmouth, they look at the lot, like the square footage of the lot as a separate circumstance that does come into play, but not necessarily regarding the structure, right? So if the structure meets setbacks, they would look at the structures being conforming. Whereas in another community, if you have an undersized lot, you would perhaps dissimilarly look at that dwelling as being non-conforming. Frank, uh, yeah. is what you're saying that we should restructure this so that the first portions limit themselves to structures and uses yes, and uh, bring yeah. lots into the dialogue? I think lots are treated differently. And there's a section that, that covers non-conforming lots. And they're not really the same thing. They're non-conforming. No but they're treated differently. Uh, yeah. And the same problem, by the way, occurs in section two, right? To write the next paragraph down where you say uh, state and town regulate regulatory authority, non-conforming structures, uses and lots are regulated, blah, blah, blah. And then the second sentence, unless preemptively regulated under state structures, all uh, state statute, all structures and uses within the town shall comply with the town zoning bylaws. And what happened to lots there? We, we it got dropped. Um, I mean, we start yeah. out by saying it, there were three things. We're talking about three things, and then at the end of the paragraph, we're only talking about two. Yeah. Just, just a, a, yes, I, I, uh... right. You should be consistent through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll make a note of that, and Bob and I will we'll talk about it in terms of how to fix. I have another we'll comment on A also. Um, around halfway down the paragraph is a sentence that starts with additionally, where state law expressly declares a non-conforming structure to be deemed a lawful pre-existing non-conforming structure. And then you refer to 40A7. I don't see the, the, the word or the phrase pre-existing in that statute. Um, it's a lawful non-conforming structure it's not a lawful pre-existing non-conforming structure which i think is a different animal yes yes i agree so i think pre-existing should be struck i agree all right yeah i agree okay let's go on Something i would else. also capitalize the word state just so that it's set apart well, on the question of capitalizing, Bob and I have adopted the convention that when we are referring to the state as the Commonwealth, it's a capital S. Yep. And when we refer to the bylaw of the town of Falmouth, we use a capital B. Right. But when we're referring to state as an adjective, like a state act or a state bylaw, or refer to uh, a, a the bylaws under the statute, the word bylaw is not capitalized. So Bob and I will take another look at this, but we want to be sure that we're consistent with our drafting convention of capitalizing uh, state with a capital S and bylaw with a capital B only when we are making specific reference to the entities and not using those terms as adjectives. Right, but if you are taking out the word state, you're also inserting the word Massachusetts, right? So no. Right. Why would we take out the what? Yeah, it, it so, just state law should state law should not be capitalized. It should be lowercase. Where uh, state law, you know, just where uh, state law expressly that that is a. That is a typo. It should not be capitalized. Oh, I would assume it always should be. No, it's not referring to the Commonwealth. It's referring to the nature of the law. It's a state law. Right. The state of Massachusetts. I, right. 
No, but we're not referring to the Commonwealth itself as a government. We're referring to the law as a law, which is a state law, not a federal law, not a town law. Town or federal would be lowercase. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. I, this is what yeah. the, the Senate style manual does. Uh, in 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 they capitalize, uh, you know, the word state if they're referring to the government, the Massachusetts government. Mm -hmm. But when it's used as an adjective, it's a lowercase word. Any other comments on Section A, ten point one A? No. Right. Okay. I think we. Come. One C. Go to C. C. Latter one C language, as you can see, is um, uh, uh, from the existing Bible. So. I do want to make a comment about um, ten point one B in the notes there was um, a discussion about essentially defining or pulling out that idea of the first notice and giving that um, information about what that actually is above letter A. So I just wanted to make yeah. note of that for the group. Yeah, the goal was to keep the number of words in the bylaw to a minimum. So, on the first occurrence of the first notice of the planning board hearing on the district to five, we parenthetically quote first notice, close quote, as the term that we will thereafter make reference to. So the first occurrence will be complete, and then every subsequent occurrence will simply use the phrase first notice. So now in 10.1B, 1B, you also have listed special permits, right? Zoning board, bylaw, adopter, amended shall not apply to special permits issued before the first notice, but it would actually yeah. be applied for, right? Because if somebody no. has submitted an application prior to the first notice, you can't then hold them to that notice. No, it has to be issued, not applied for. Yeah, but you cannot you cannot um, hold somebody legally if they have applied for a special permit on Monday, and if yeah. on Friday there's a change or a notice posted in the paper, you cannot now hold them to that new notice filed or posted. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You know, the statute says issue. You actually have to have it in hand. So and if you don't have it in hand, you're, you're out of luck. Uh, so how would you retroactively enforce that? So say if somebody has applied prior to something else, we would consider that they're, as of the date they apply, they're subject to what's currently in force and effect. Uh, yeah. They're, go they're going to be subject to the new bylaw unless they have that permit issued under the old bylaw. Yep. If they've simply applied for it, they just have to keep their fingers crossed until the bylaw is is changed and hope that they're not going to be barred. Yeah, that's but the bylaw will notice. apply to them unless they have the permit issued in hand. Interesting. Yeah, that's why it's the first notice rather than town meeting action action adopting it. Oh, I understand that. I was just thinking that if somebody applied again for a special permit on Monday and the first notice published in the paper on Thursday, how are they subject to that? Because they couldn't have known about that. They weren't noticed, right? So, but now you're telling them they are subject yeah. to it, even yeah. though it's after. Okay. Yeah. Right. All right. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's 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 a tough world out there. I guess. All right. I just want to make sure. Okay. 
The application is not a placeholder. It's the issuance of the permit. Okay. In the perfect world, I'd agree with you. And I think I, I think the legislature might profitably consider making that change to the statute, but you know, but we okay. deal with what we have today. Okay. So uh let's see, one C um in the meeting notes from last April under one C one, the uh the last sentence um would have publication of deleted and then everything after the word notice deleted so it would just say a building permit or special permit issued before the first notice that was what was agreed to as part of the you don't have yeah. to, you don't have to keep repeating yeah no that, that that's that's a perfect example of why we we will replace that these words with the simple two words first notice. Okay. Then and maybe, on... maybe you add that to the definition section so that if somebody's trying to figure it out, they can find that as a reference. I, I would prefer to leave it the way we've done it. So that the first time we read the bylaw and you come across the term from that point on, you understand what first notice means. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, the definition I, is in I think one B. That was what was agreed to be added right at the top of num under one B one. Note note that the first notice refers to the first notice of the planning board public hearing on zoning amendments as required by forty eight five. It's right there. So, right. Okay. Again, I don't think again I'm. Well, I'm Noticing should we consider that, should we consider uh adding that definition to the definition section if i mean if 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 it's it may be redundant but if it's informative well the, the only reason why i bring this up is we have people who are trying to be as quick and brief as possible and if you expect them to read three pages but they're pulling one sentence mm -hmm. out of the three pages you know, it can be a pain in the yeah. backside to try and explain to them, here's yeah. what that means, yeah. right? And people don't yeah. want to read three pages. I hear you. Bob, could we do that? Could we add that to the yeah, definition we, section? We, we can write yeah. something up. We can write something up. Yeah, I think that's a good good suggestion, Ari. Thank you. course with AI you know everybody's just going to be able to say what they want into the computer for the future and the computer will fill, figure it out for them why don't we let AI complete this conversation that works for me <laughs> yeah one C uh Yeah, I, I'm looking at the notes and it. We're looking at number two under 101C. And there was some uh, discussion about this whole idea of a finding from the ZBA. Um, and if a special permit was going, because special permit process was going to be used for that finding. Yeah. I think this is somewhat of a dense conversation, and I would suggest that we sort of skip over it for now so that we can make some more progress on the remainder of the bylaw and maybe come back. But if that's inappropriate, shoot me down. Jed, I recall coming up with two options after that conversation where I offered, I don't know whether I shared this with everybody, but whenever finding is prescribed by the bylaw, it should be understood to mean something. I came up with two renderings uh, that I I would I would repropose uh, to be inserted so that we make clear what we are talking about. Uh, very quickly, I'll say one of them, the one I prefer. Whenever a quote finding close quote is prescribed in this bylaw, it should be understood to mean facts found by the 
SPGA or zoning board as you choose in accordance with procedures established by the board, not inconsistent with state law. The zoning board may adopt procedures similar to those used for special permit applications, so long as the board's final action is limited to making the finding or findings specified in this bylaw. So we, we could continue to play around with the language, but I, I think the point uh, of, of agreement that we had a year ago was that something should be added on what we mean by the finding. And I apologize, it wasn't section two, which you see on your screen, it was section three, this, this section right. that I'm highlighting here. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially the board's practice is while the state law calls out the board to make findings, they do indeed make findings, but then based on their findings, they make a determination. So we refer to that determination and subsequent grant as a special permit. Yeah, I think the only the only point of concern to me from a legal point of view is that the availability of the procedures governing special permits is tempting to use because it's a structure that we're all familiar with. So if when we're making a finding, we treat it as if it were a special permit, except when you reach the conclusion, uh, you, you don't have the latitude and of discretion uh, that you do with a special permit. In other words, uh, you, you can make a finding and that's the basis for going forward. Uh, it, it doesn't make find, it doesn't, we can't convert finding to special permit. The, 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 the statute talks about a finding. It doesn't elevate the requirement to being those of a special permit. So, and, and you know, again, the, the legislature doesn't help us because they use the term finding and they don't tell us exactly what they mean by it. But it's a finding of fact. What the what the board is doing is making a determination what the facts are, right, and then right. once those facts are found, uh, you go forward with it. Right, but here's the problem: is that you know you make the quote findings, but then that determination can be appealed by any party, right? So if you don't file a document that memorializes your actions you're also precluding somebody's appellate rights. Well, the decision will state what the findings are. Any creditable uh, decision right. of the board will have to state what their findings of fact are. If, a, if the decision doesn't state findings of fact that the statute says must be found, right. then it's just a poorly drafted decision. Clearly, there will be a document that will ground an appeal uh, unless the board just does a sloppy job in drafting the decision and fails to men mention what findings it makes with regard to the facts. Right. So those are always um, well memorialized within the decisions. Um, but the practice has been that when you have these nonconformities that they're asking for these options for, that you make a finding and then you your determination is to to grant the person's request, right? Yeah, I mean if this if the statute if this if, if a finding is required, then it's only by, by virtue of the fact that there is some application pending in which the finding of fact is relevant. Right. And then, then you take it take it from there. Right. So what we we have people do is they they apply for a special permit within which the board makes those findings and then its decision. Well, if if you treat it as if it was a special permit, you're really not you know, you're you're retreating from the language 
that the you know the the statute is calling for. Well, but, a special I mean, permit is a discretionary right. uh, uh, decision on the part of the board. Right. A finding, um, um, you know, if you use the special permit process, you can't reach the conclusion that it's denied. You have to make a finding. So I just think you don't want to confuse findings with special permits. Uh, and uh, we need to be clear about that. Well, Bob, I, I mean, my only comment is I don't know of a single town that doesn't use spe the special permit process yes. for the zoning board to make a finding. I don't either. Everyone makes that. I mean, it, it's just right. become it's just become the way it is. And so what, do you, what do you call the outcome? Is it a finding or is it a special permit? It's a special permit that includes findings. So, I, I mean, the courts have long never said anything, you know, is wrong with using the special permit process to make a finding within the special permit process. So I, I don't really think okay. this is an issue. If there, were a, if there were a case, if there were a case when a special permit was denied, when all that the applicant needed was a finding of fact. Right, but the denial would be based on the lack of finding, right? The findings okay. would say, hey, this is more detrimental. Okay. This is okay. um, closer to the neighbor. This is twice the height. It's an imposition at whatever. So, yeah, so right. the findings yeah. would support the, the ultimate decision. Yeah, one way or another. Okay. And okay. then and then we have that filed at the registry so that you have a record. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm I'm not going to act like Don Quixote here. If uh if the consensus is uh to do it that way, we'll do it that way. Okay. Um so let's see. N one C. Um anything. So yeah, so in in ten one c two, uh, last section, uh, last uh, D, at the end there, where you have the word accept, I would, you know, maybe change that to mirror what we were doing above and write the word exception. Yeah. Okay. Just so that we're like I say, um, I I have three kids. Yeah. Looking at the younger generation, I think people are looking to shorten everything, right? They don't even call people by their full names anymore. Yeah. So I think wherever we can be incredibly yeah. concise, it will be helpful. I agree with you, Noreen. And I think I think the word accept is the area in which the state legislature has sinned most egregiously. Uh, it 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 creates grammatical ambiguities, and I think your suggestion does clarify things. So we ought to read the document, and wherever we can make that change, we'll do so. That would be ideal. Yeah, yeah we should just be thankful. I I you. have to uh, take my wife to a medical appointment, so I have a I probably have another fifteen minutes or so. We all do. That's it. Yeah. We're all going with you and your wife. Okay. In the car. <laughs> all right. Okay. Anything else on one C? I do think it's worth stating that, you know, there was a discussion about the language in number three about, and I'll highlight it on the screen here. It is the purpose of the bylaw yeah. to discourage the perpetuity, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, I think we were yeah. going to change that to encourage, do a more positive um, right. twist on that. We so just just making a note of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that, that's been an ongoing struggle for the zoning board because all applicants come in and they all say, hey, I'm pre-existing non-conforming. And, you know, it's most unfortunate when you get the raise and rebuilds because people may have the opportunity to become conforming but where the bylaw allows them not to, they don't. I, I think, as I remember, the, the, the plan was to delete, take that last sentence and remove it from subsection three 
and state that someplace up near the beginning of the uh of yeah, the bylaw. That, that would be ideal, like up at applicability or something where you say, yeah. hey, hey, look, you know, we really yeah. because then it, it also gives the zoning board some opportunity to say to people, hey, look, we really yeah. are encouraging you. Yeah. Or I, I agree. I agree with that completely. Okay, we'll move that up then. We'll move that up. Um, 10 2 B, non conforming structures other than single and two family dwellings. Did I miss something here? Unless there's anything else. On, wait a minute. Um, oh, um, with. Uh... I'm sorry, 10 1 D. Anything on 10 1 D? Ten... What section? Wait a minute. Before D, going oh. <laughs> going back to uh ten one C five, we're gonna have to do something with this two or more residential dwellings issue because we're now allowing accessory dwelling units. So yeah. this this whole section needs to get fixed because we're yeah. gonna eventually have hot water hitting cold water where someone's coming in and applying for a second residential dwelling and we're telling yeah. them no but yet we allow accessory dwellings so Noreen, can you can you can you give us a, a new text for subsection five if you pay me yes i i can work on something i i think okay i don't i don't know how we're gonna well we may just have to literally get rid of this whole uh date thing right because yeah it re really is sort of no longer applicable in that if somebody has a second dwelling and say it's not as far back as may of 1959 but they say hey you know i'm going to use this as an accessory dwelling unit how yeah. are we gonna say how are we going to say no yeah so we yeah we're, well this is there's, there's no state law governing this. This is what the town wants to do. And right. you just want to make sure that it expresses what you do want to do. Right. So maybe that would be um, myself and a couple of close friends here can help me with that language. Because yeah. Yeah, I think we need to, well, we can't avoid. We have the accessory dwelling units, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, I mean, it just raises to me so many towns have adopted adus what did other right. towns do because it's right but right statutory language so right but we don't want to be telling people no and then two pages mm -hmm. later you say wait a minute come on in and help yourself right i know but yeah just uh just check down the road and see who's adopted adus and see if they even thought about this or not and have yeah. language. yeah probably not especially if people take an existing bylaw and then just amend it by adding a new section. It doesn't fix your old. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Is it permitted ADU non-conforming? What's that? Is a permitted ADU non-conforming? No, it's it's allowed by uh, planning board and or zoning board. So why are we treating it in the non-conforming section? Well, that's, I guess, another part of it is maybe we're taking it out or maybe we're saying that it it's allowable by special permit because it well though you could have a pre-existing structure right like you could have two structures on a lot and then somebody could propose to convert that second dwelling to an adu and then well, it would you, would, you wouldn't need to farming. you wouldn't no. need to if it's already a dwelling you don't you don't need yeah to I, 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 i'm with frank on this if, if the uh if the section dealing with this topic is covered elsewhere, it, it's superfluous in this particular section. It could so be deleted maybe, with no harm. Maybe maybe we'd consider total deletion then. Yeah. No. Well, I, I mean, no. but, this... but they're actually different things. They yeah. are. Yeah. Right. They are different. Right. Things. right. Yeah. yeah. And why I mean, isn't an ADU treated in this section as yeah. as an exception, except right. an approved ADU? Right. Well, then they know the uh, process they they referred to the correct process. Oh, that's an interesting option. Uh, I'm confused. This... So I think I think what 
she's well, let me let me just uh, yeah. explain my how I interpret this and see yeah. and you can all tell me if I'm wrong or not. But anything contrary to the contrary in this bylaw, notwithstanding Penmore money, shall not apply to the residential use of two or more dwellings on a single lot, which shall be deemed a pre-existing non-conforming use of commenced prior to 1959. Oh, so the ADU is what's contrary. So maybe it's okay. Mm -hmm. Or maybe okay. maybe you put in parens at the end of that, C-A-D-U or something, so that you're you're pointing somebody to where they should be looking. Because I think otherwise you really are sort of having two opposite statements within your bylaw. Yeah, but the ADUs aren't non-conforming uses. They're allowed by right. Right. Yeah, they're allowed. So I don't know why it would fall into this. It doesn't. The thought is it could maybe sneak in here to be something that doesn't uh, conform yeah. to the ADU yeah. rules. Supposing on your lot you've got a big yeah. second um, a barn, and now you get to turn it into a house, and it's it's much bigger than the ADU allows. No, couldn't do that. No, this says shall not apply to the residential use of two or more dwellings on a single lot if that use commenced prior to May nineteenth, nineteen fifty nine. Yeah, there had to be two or more dwellings on the lot before yeah, that date. Nice. So nobody can build, you know, two giant dwellings on a lot today. This is goes back to 1959. Yeah. And an ADU is a smaller unit by definition. Right. So I, I just don't see the connection. I don't think we should treat it here. Okay, 101D. Anything in 101D? This is a new section. Again, trying to. So I think the confusion I have for 101D1 is you seem to be starting out to tell somebody what not increasing the non conforming nature is, but then you say, well, we don't have a definition. So I'm finding 10.1 D1 to be confusing. This is probably the most empowering uh, feature of the statute confusing. because because the the, the state law uses non-conforming nature of 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 the structure um, as a as a as a a barrier to local decision making, but it leaves up to the town the uh, ability, the power to define the term. So even though the state says, however you define the term non-conforming nature of the structure, you have to use that uh, to understand the the prohibitions of the state statute. So. Uh, Bob and I felt that this is an invitation too good to turn down, and it, we we want to equip the town with meaning to this expression uh, that is favorable to the town's prerogative of doing zoning. So we want to make clear uh, what we mean by that term, because uh, it is that. our way yeah. of providing what we can do and what we can't do in the town of Falmouth. I get you. I see what you mean now. Okay. 10.2A. Now we're in a non-conforming single and two-family dwelling. Uh, again, this is um, uh, the first A, anyway, is all existing language from your bylaw. And then B has a mix of existing and new language. Any comments, questions, thoughts? Um, so I did have one comment with um, 
10.2 A3, where you have increase in nonconformity. And um, my proposal was to leave the language until you get to um, that results in a new nonconformity shall be deemed to be an increase in the nonconforming nature of the structure. Uh, so according to my reading, that someone would require a variance if they have a new nonconformity. So I guess I was just proposing that that be made explicit. Well, understand uh, 10.2, covering non-conforming structures is divided into two parts. 2A covers the special favorable treatment accorded to single and two family. Right. So all one, two, and three that follow are only limited to those special cases. Um, right. But, but the law seems to indicate that a new non-conformity. Yeah. So, uh, deemed to be an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure would require a variance. Unless the town, um, unless the town simply, um, you know, defined non-conforming nature of the structure uh, generously uh, to, to allow this to not be such. So, the, the, the statute says that if a change, an increase in the nonconformity of a single and two family mm -hmm. does change the nonconforming nature of the structure, and like other kinds of structures, it can go forward with a simple finding. Um, Whereas if it were not a single or two family, it would require a variance. But a variance is not required for single and two family. So I I thought there was case law that indicated that there was a difference. So for example, mm -hmm. if you had a single family dwelling that was non-conforming because it was too close to a lot line, and they now yeah. wanted to add a second story such that right. they were exceeding the height limit of the bylaw. Uh -huh. My understanding is the only way you could exceed the height limit of the bylaw would be by variance. Even though it's a single uh, unless, well. unless you simply declare that uh, increasing the height is is uh, is is uh, is increasing the nonconformity. And you make a finding that it's not more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood, in which case you can go forward without a well, without a variance. So I I guess I would put a big fat question mark there because I think the town has been very very careful thus far to make sure that that's not the case. In that particularly where we have people who are elevating to be out of the flood zone. The yeah. intent is to not then have these homes where we have a 35 yeah. foot height limit. We don't want people yep. going up to 55 and they say, well, we're yep. just more non-conforming because we need to be. And what does what's the inf effect of that on their neighbors? Right. So well, you could you could agree. You could agree that that is an increase in the non-conforming, but you're going to make a finding that it's not more substantially detrimental and go and they can go forward with it. Yeah, I don't know. I can't picture that. I mean, I don't know what the town's appetite is. I shouldn't speak for my board, but I wouldn't guess that that would be anything they would want to. Because here's the other part of the problem is what if the zoning board just grants all these people exceptions to the height bylaw? And now you're going to have structures all over town that randomly are substantially taller. Ugh. And Noreen, just to clarify, does the zoning board now require a variance for this kind of uh, circumstance, even for a single or a two family? Uh, so I that would be my understanding. We've typically not had the request because we've told people that the height limit is 35 feet and the board's not going to grant you more than that. 
the only exception to that is, um, you know, things like a cupola or whatever, and those are yeah. called out in the bylaw, or chimney, something like yeah. that, that, that can exceed the, the ridge height. But the board has held people very stringently to that ridge height, Max. The, the, the town is giving a very, it has been given by statute uh, a considerable latitude in saying what is and isn't an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure. Yeah. So knock yourself out. You know, let the bylaw be as explicit and comprehensive and and generous as you want to be or not. So you this is your opportunity to say what is and isn't an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure. All right. These, so if we if, if we leave the language as is, then it gives the board the discretion. Correct. Or no? I have to really leave. I'm sorry, but yep. Um, okay. uh, just just looking forward, I think our next meeting we, we should have available to us a document that we call the most current rendering that includes as much as what we've covered today yep. as we can do. That would it may need good. further work, yeah. but um, that will that will make our next session a little bit more focused, and it will give Bob and me an opportunity to, you know, implement some of the things that we've already decided. Yeah. Also, I think Bob and I need to talk about a couple of these questions that got raised that haven't quite been answered, and we need to figure out what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. All right, All so right. let's let's put a pin in this combo and and talk about the next meeting. Very quickly, what what works for you guys? I am, I mean, we we typically have been doing the fourth Wednesday of the month. However, I am not available on the twenty sixth. That would be June twenty sixth. Um, if people can meet the week prior and not on the holiday, perhaps the day after. So the twentieth of June. Does that work for everybody? Yeah, uh, June twenty. I I just um, say, uh, for what it's worth, I am not available at all the last two weeks in June. Oh, okay. Bob, don't they have uh, cell signals in Norway? Uh, you can join us. Uh, oh, how I don't cool. know. I'm not going to be in Norway, so I don't know whether they. Have okay, them. well. But I'm not going to be getting up at you know three o'clock in the morning to go on a Zoom okay. with Thelma. Uh, sorry, we'll folks. we'll just come visit you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we any other June, dates? June twelfth. That's pretty close. You guys would be able to get edits to us, and June twelfth is too close for me. Okay. Uh, um, my my schedule is really crazy. Yeah, I'm booked all the way through the twelfth, so I wouldn't have time to put together a second draft. July ten, um, or is that too late? Could do July. 10th. July tenth is fine. Tenth okay. works for me. Works for me. I'm okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. July tenth. Are we doing we'll do news? This, we'll 11? do the same time, 11. 11? Okay. Um, just a suggestion, you know, we're still only, at, we only got to 10 to b which is the same place we ended last meeting a year ago. It's all my fault, I'm um, sorry. If you, <laughs> you know, if some of you could, you know, if you have the time, ha, 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 you know, to get together and kind of work your way yeah. through the rest of it with, your own comments so that might move things faster or along because once we're into july we're getting pretty close to september and public hearings and yeah. all, uh, warrant closings and all that stuff so agreed if that's a possibility bob, i would suggest you try to arrange that all right bob bob is it to be or not to be i'm gonna keep we will see all right <laughs> okay all right Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Very helpful. Very, very helpful. But, Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.